Bom dia. Good morning. We we'll start this session with our great and dear colleague Nico Carpentier. Nico arrived in Brasilia at 3 a.m. today after a trip to Rio, but I think he will survive with our care and attention during this workshop about exhibitions or, in other words, beyond the written text, visual sociology as a way to communicate academic research. It's the third workshop developed by Nico in our school, in our faculty of communication, and next Friday uh, at 10 a.m. we are organizing a new activity related to communication, uh, production of knowledge, and slow science. Nico, in the end of this workshop, has conditions to make um, merchandising about this activity as well. So the idea is listen Nico, and afterwards we have a, something like 30 minutes to discuss these questions related to this project that includes the exhibition in the Factory of Architecture and Urbanism. Do you, uh, were you there in the fact of architecture and urbanism in the exhibition about Cyprus? Did you visit this exhibition? Who, please? Okay, it's mandatory to be there after the workshop. Nico, the time is yours. Thank you again. I think we should all just go there, forget about the workshop, and have a look at the exhibition. Um, good morning from my side as well. I won't do the repetition of three times of good morning. Um, I think it works once to wake us up. Um, and I'll, if I fall asleep here, just kick me and I'll, uh, I'll go on. So thanks for being here. Uh, early bird session. Uh, I admire your courage. I also admire my courage. Uh, we're here we are gathered here in this lovely environment, as they would say in church, uh, to talk about, as they would not say in church, to talk about visual sociology and to talk about the role of uh, different methods to communicate academic research. And that's the reason why the, 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 actually the title of this talk uh, and workshop and discussion is called Beyond the Written Text. Right? So. I should probably start by explaining that writing, academic writing, is incredibly important to us. Um, all of us have been students. Some of you are still students. Most of us are actually still students in different ways. And one of the big parts of training, of academic training, is actually to be exposed to academic writing. Right? Student papers are something you start with fairly early and that stay with you um, for the entire duration of the studies. What academics do is write. They publish articles, book chapters, books. They actually do a lot of writing. They also write a lot of emails, but that's another thing. <laughs> but it's very much about the written text. It's very, very important to our, um, not just our ways of doing things, but actually very important to our identity, to who we are as academics. And of course, then there's the other side of the story, and that's the reading. Right? We not only write a lot, we actually read a lot of these written texts. It's our main way of communicating our research to others. And one of the big myths of academic writing is that nobody reads it. Right? You know these cliches where they say, well, if you, if you write an article, then uh, your first reader, well, that's yourself. <laughs> your second reader, these are the peer reviewers that evaluate it. And probably the, the editor of journal or book series. And yeah, the fifth one, that's probably your partner that really likes you. Right? That's the myth. There's been quite some research 
into readership of academic texts. And in some cases, it's actually extremely high. Um, the numbers for some of the journals and some of particular articles are quite considerable. But of course, it's very difficult to measure. And downloads, because we more and more went to, to online publishing, downloads are only indicators. But in some cases, the number of downloads are extremely high. And we talk about 10,000 of downloads for one text. Now, of course, you could have the assumption that 10,000 people just download it and then forget about it. And that's probably part of what actually happens. But another part actually does read it. And then you use another indication, because in some cases they actually use it. They cite it. And these are citations are actually, in 99% of the cases, are indications of readership. People do read what we write. And it matters to what we do uh, tremendously. And there's some of the research I'm, I'm showing here, which is actually um, referring to numbers of, of downloads uh, which go into the millions of our writings, if you start aggregating them. Uh, and these are illustrations of this kind of research um, into readership, into uh, right, the readership of our academic writings. And the, here, the, annual, the estimated annual downloads of full text articles from publisher sites are estimated at 2.5 billion. So don't <laughs> say nobody reads it. I think we need to be very careful. I think there's a lot of our material that we write actually being read, and that makes it even more significant. Um, pediatrics, which is one example in this study, um, the average uh, numbers of readers for one article was 14,000 and a half. So we're not doing too bad when it comes to readership. Now, I'm not saying that everybody reads everything, right? Some articles are indeed just plain forgotten. And I would probably add that in some cases it's good that they're plain forgotten. But that's just a personal comment. Writing hurts. I think you agree. I think you've all experienced this. It's a very difficult process. It's a very uh, important process at the same time. And I'm not going to sound masochistic if I say that going through these stages of pain and frustration is actually part of the learning process. It's how we build our intellectual capacities, by confronting us with thresholds that we want to reach. And this is where excellence and self-improvement comes in. So writing is part of that strategy. It is a confrontation with our own limits and our attempts to overcome these restrictions to get better because that's very much what academia is about and the writing the written text plays a very important role in that process and it has been uh, playing that role for centuries and this is not a new strategy writing significantly matters if you go back to the middle ages and um, before the session started uh, I told some of you right, my university Uppsala University was established in 1477 and if you trace it back to these days writing was as significant as it was now possibly even more so there is a long history of this kind of intellectual capacity building that is centered around the written text even if in many cases it is quite painful, but at the same time, we all love books. Right? There is a, a sense of care in the academic community for our writing. And that is also quite important. If, I don't know if you know the experience, but some people have the, the habit of breaking the back of a book. Right? So they take the book and then they do this <laughs> thing. And I could kill somebody if I see that, because that hurts me. Right? That's how much we care about books and about articles. We want to see them preserved. We like the smell of paper. We like this idea of being able to touch. And nowadays, we actually also like this other version, which is the on-screen text that we can read. Uh, even if we sometimes have a bit more of a complicated relationship with that, it, is become, or it has become part of our, our love 
for reading and writing. So don't get me wrong, whatever I'll be talking about is based on this, on the love for the written text. But what I would also like to argue that maybe we can add different repertoires, different ways of communicating our academic knowledge to what we already have. And of course there are already other formats that are very old and I'm actually engaging in one of them. Right? The talk, the lecture, uh, the discourse, as, as the French would, would have it. This is equally important in many, many cases. Rhetorics actually have been studied for a couple of thousands of years. Um, and it really matters to us as well. But maybe we can push it even further. And the argument I want to make here at this stage is for the use of photography. Um, and that's often captured by the label of visual sociology. Now I should immediately add a couple of things. One thing that I need to add is that this is about the communication of academic research. This is not necessarily about the illustration of academic research, which is a little nuance that might matter tremendously. Because in a lot of texts, of course, people use photographs to illustrate the point that I want to make. But this is not what this talk is about. This is actually about the validation of photography as a tool to communicate the research itself through right, the technology of photography. That's one rather important point. And I've had tremendous fights with colleagues about this when they say like, oh yeah, but the pictures, they're just to illustrate, so would you mind if we remove them? And then I go like, N -n -n I actually would mind a bit, yeah. If, if you really want to sort of remove something, then remove me and the entire article, and, but don't touch my pictures, because they're the core. Or they're at least on an equal footing with some of the written text that is combined with it. Right? The format of the visual essay is actually the combination of photography and text on an equal footing, where both text and photography play the same role, and where they're actually integrated. The second thing I need to add is that, of course, photography is one way to communicate, but I'll also be talking about a second one, uh, which is not the same, and that's the second tool that I want to talk about is the exhibition. And of course I'm going to talk about exhibitions that use photography. But I'm also going to talk about the exhibitions that use other types of tools to communicate that move beyond um, photography. I'll talk about installation, for instance. Uh, and I'll even talk about poetry, maybe dance. Maybe at some point I'll, I'll turn it into a real workshop and invite you to dance your thesis if you don't mind, but that's for later. Uh, rest assured, <laughs> I won't uh, abuse you too much uh, in early, uh, early morning. So, photography is quite important in my story, but don't reduce my story to photography. There are other tools, and the exhibition is a tool in itself. The exhibition, of course, uses objects, it uses text, it uses all sorts of elements, but it uses them in a, it's a repertoire, a language in its own right. And it's not an easy language to use, by the way. Okay, you're still with me? So that's what we'll talk about, uh, or at least try. Now, theoretically and methodologically, this is part of uh, what is uh, more and more called arts-based research. Arts based research, ABR, uh, abbreviated. And a number of authors have argued that we are now more and more in what they call an artistic turn. Now, I, there's a footnote, right? Because if you look at academic theory, we've had so many turns that we're all very dizzy by now. The linguistic turn, the cultural turn, the demotic turn, there's an endless list of turns in academia where we sort of reorient ourselves and put more emphasis on a particular component. But I would argue that in the case of the artistic turn, yes, it's one more, but it's an important one and it is actually becoming visible. And if you start looking at publications that deal with 
this artistic turn with arts-based research, you'll, you'll find a lot. It's actually remarkable how many that already are here and how often it is used. Maybe not always in media and communication studies. Maybe this time we're actually a bit slow <laughs> and others are actually quicker than we are. Uh, and so a, a lot of the things that I've been trying to do is to catch up with the others <laughs> in our field. Uh, not saying that this is totally new, actually arguing that it's not new. It's part of a bigger movement in academia that is using artistic um, processes to produce knowledge. And there's many, many, many things to be said about that. Uh, how that relationship works, how that method or that series of strategy, strategies work. But there is also a long history to that. And a number of authors have been writing about this going back into different uh, sociological um, approaches that were focusing on literature. And that's what the book you see there, Sociology Through Literature, that's what that book was trying to do, is to actually understand literature as part of sociological phenomena. That's not about using arts-based research, but it's one of these predecessors that allows us to think about a much more complicated relationship between traditional social sciences and, and humanities um, on the one hand and literature and the arts on the other. And that has pushed into a series of academic practices that started using uh, the arts as a tool to generate knowledge, but also, of course, respecting arts and its independence as a way to produce arts, as something that has an art artistic dimension, a creative dimension embedded within it. So if you look at all these publications, you'll actually see a group of people that is trying to create a new uh, method, and actually they would say uh, a, a new paradigm. Uh, they might be a bit excessive in their formulation there, but for instance, if you look at uh, Levy's work, Patricia Levy's work, she argues that arts-based research is a third paradigm next to the quantitative and the qualitative traditions. I think that's a bit pushing it too far, <laughs> to be honest. But it shows what's being done. It shows what they're actually trying to do, is to establish a, a, a body of theories, of methods, of research practices that is integrated and that actually has a right of existence on its own next to qualitative and qualitative, uh, quantitative research. As I said, I think this is slightly overambitious um, because I think it's underestimating the overlaps that exist, for instance, between arts-based research and qualitative approaches. But let's not go there. Let's look at what they're saying. Uh, and there are a couple of, uh, of elements in this table that are actually quite interesting and I want to point out to you. One, and that's the third one, is the difference between measurement, meaning and evocation. Right? The quantitative approach is of course about measuring. The qualitative approach is about analyzing meaning. Arts-based research is about evoking meaning. It's about allowing people to experience things. It's allowing people to experience knowledge, which is quite an interesting strategy to use. And that is a key component of arts-based research. Another line that I want to point out to you, reliability, process, and authenticity. Right? Arts-based research is about authenticity, creating something that you can experience that is experienced as authentic, as real um, as possible. And that makes it specific as well. But the third one that I want to point out is actually my, uh, my favorite. Um, it's the last but one. Uh, generalizability, which is typical for quantitative research. Uh, the uh, transferability, which is typical for qualitative research, right? You do your small-scale research and then you can argue that what you find there can be transferred to broader social reality. So that's the transferability, which is an important notion there. What art-based research comes up is the wonderful idea of resonance. Right? It, it resonates. It 
it's like if you throw the circle, uh, if you throw the stone in the water, you have these ripples, right? That's resonance. It moves. It doesn't always move very clearly. It moves in very different directions, but it resonates um, with social uh, experience. It's the idea if you stand in front of a, a piece of art and you've got this feeling, oh yeah, that's it. That's resonance and that's authenticity. Right? That's what arts-based research is trying to do. It's making people feel knowledge, which I think is a quite interesting approach. If it works, of course. I'm not saying that research always works and that applies for all three, for the quantitative, the qualitative and the arts-based. If you look at Levy's work and the example she's discussing, it's actually quite spectacular. And it, this book was also quite an eye-opener for me because she comes up with areas that I wasn't familiar with, where a number of authors have been working. And I was half-jokingly, well, that's what you thought, referring to dance. Eh -eh. <laughs> it wasn't a joke. Um, dance has been used in arts-based research as a way to communicate research and to generate knowledge in its own right at the same time. Poetry has been used to do that. Fiction has been used to do that. Um, music has been uh, used. Theater, and I think you're, we're actually getting close to what we're familiar with. Theater has also been used. Documentary film obviously has also been used. But also fiction film has been used. So there are many, many examples. My interest is mostly in the visual arts, right, which is chapter seven of the book, so it's also there. Um, I would argue that this is a bit of a shortcut, sort of it condenses things too much because visual arts is sort of broad. There's lots of visual arts there. It's not really everything that, um, that can be captured, but hey, um, it's there and it does play a role. But to give you another example, and maybe I should be careful of putting ideas into your minds. Uh, this is a PhD. I'm flattening. Um, uh, Nick uh, uh, Susanis. Um, it's a comic book. It's a comic strip. It's not bad. Uh, it's a really interesting experiment. But again, I should be careful putting ideas into people's minds. These examples do exist. Uh, it doesn't mean that the acceptance of these practices, for instance, by academic juries that then need to evaluate the work, goes without any conflict. It, on the contrary, this is new territory, and it actually new territory, new territory always brings conflicts as well. And I've seen a number of these conflicts that are quite complicated um, and, and not always very pleasant to see in trying to redefine what actually academic uh, work, what a PhD thesis is. But this is an interesting example of something that actually um, reached the end point of generating a PhD, a PhD thesis and a PhD. So we've had these experiments. Um, what will come next has some narcissism in it. I'm going to talk about my own exhibitions, my own uh, artworks, my own installations, my own photography. And it's interesting that I need to say this. Because if I would be talking here about my new book, I wouldn't feel slightly uncomfortable, at the least. But because I'm talking now about something which is outside our comfort zone, I need to say that. I'm, I'm doing something which is a bit narcissistic. Uh, which is in itself, of course, an indication of the newness, the novelty of these approaches and the fact that it, it generates all sorts of issues also in how we define ourselves. By the way, and that's a footnote, I often use the triple A definition for myself, right, the three A's, academic, artist and activist. And I do think we can integrate them. Uh, but these integrations are not easy and they question our position, and they allow others to question our position. Right? So, narcissistic chapter starting now. <laughs> the first project I want to talk to you about is called Respublica. It was a fairly big one, 
this is the, the main poster. Uh, it was based in Cyprus, working together with a, um, well, you'll find some of the logos uh, below as far as you can see them, uh, working together with NIM, uh, which is an art center in Cyprus, in Limassol, actually extremely interested in the generation of both academic and artistic uh, reflections. So it's a very theoretical driven art center in Cyprus, a very interesting place. And I was working with a uh, community media center, CCMC, that's based in Nicosia, in the capital of, um, of Cyprus. Um, that was the core team, but there were actually quite a lot of volunteers because it got slightly out of hand. <laughs> it, it grew a bit quicker than I thought. And probably the gray hairs on this side of my head, that's Respublica. Um, it was quite an experience. Uh, it was uh, late 2017, early uh, 2018, so it's still fresh. Right? The trauma is still in me. Uh, I haven't overcome uh, all this. I still wake up screaming at night, Respublica! <laughs> um, but anyway, at the same time, it was quite an interesting uh, and a very um, satisfying uh, experience. Uh, and that's maybe something to talk about later. What Respublica wanted to do was very particular. Uh, it came out, the idea came out of a research project. Uh, I did a large research project, not just on, uh, on the statues on Cyprus, but I was actually looking at the role of community media on the island as an attempt for democratization of the media there and as an attempt for peace building there. That was my main interest. That was the reason why I was there for a year, studying that. But then the book was ready, the publications were ready, and I was thinking like, should I now just do the promotional tour or should I do something else? Obviously, yeah, something else. Uh, I then very quickly moved to the idea, why don't I allow community media activists to talk about the conclusions of the book instead of me doing that? Instead of me just saying, hey, I got this wonderful book and it's, all, it's so clever, uh, it has great conclusions, it's really relevant, it will change the history. Well, you know these things, right? But I was thinking, well, why don't I allow others to speak? And they will actually, because I've researched them, they will say things that are very much aligned with what the, uh, the book was about. Moreover, I was actually in very close dialogues with them about the book. So they also knew it, they reviewed it, they worked with it, so they, they knew it very well. And that became Respublica. The second idea behind that was that in community media, we tend to forget that there is a strong artistic dimension. Right? We often look at community media as, as spaces of democratization. And in Cyprus, it's also a space of peace building. We look at, this, at, at community media as alternative locations, but mostly from a political um, uh, ideological perspective. And that's perfectly fine and that's perfectly accurate. They do play that role. But what we sometimes forget is how creative the people are that are working there and how they connect to the arts themselves. So we created the concept of the community, me uh, the community media affiliated artist the people working in the, the environment of community media that were affiliated to them, but that also did artistic work. And we went to look for them. Uh, we opened up a call. Uh, we organized quite a number of workshops explaining the, f the format of Respublica to them, inviting them to participate in this project, to submit art projects that would then become part of, uh, of Respublica. And that's where it got out of hand, <laughs> slightly. Uh, we ended up doing three exhibitions. One really big one, which is Participation Matters. Uh, we ended up doing a festival, which was condensed in one week, which had something like 17 different events, uh, with film screenings, with performances in different cities outside the gallery, which was really important to us, moving outside the arts gallery. Um, not to sound too, using too much of a cliche, but the idea of taking arts to the people. Uh, moving away from the, uh, the white cube that an art space always is. Uh, 
Right? You know that art galleries, they have to be white. Right? That's, that's the rule. Right? You can't have a blue uh, art gallery. That would be very upsetting. It's a white cube, uh, which is the name of a gallery, by the way. Uh, if you don't know it, look it up. It's an interesting place. But so the idea uh, grew, uh, and it, it went a bit, um, well, not viral. It just spiraled out of control. We had one main exhibition, which was a solo exhibition of Jut and Wachter, who are two artists, actually quite famous guys, that work on uh, the use of digital technologies to support activism. That's their big topic. And they do wonderful things, also with a very strong artistic dimension in there. So we had an exhibition from them. We had the Participation Matters, which I'll show you in a second. I'll show you a quick video about it. Then we had uh, a Materia uh, exhibition, which was a very small exhibition linked to one of the projects of Participation Matters. Uh, Participation Matters had 18. One of them was a wonderful project about allowing, it was a participatory project, allowing people that were dying to produce videos about themselves, moving away from the representation as patient, right, as sort of this flesh that is about to disappear, moving away to a self-representation of the dying person as the living person that is still precious, even if we know that they will disappear quite soon, or they knew that they would die very, very soon. One of them actually died during the recording, so uh, then the partner finished the film. We took that, uh, it, was, it was five films, we took these five films and we built a separate exhibition about them, and we put that in a hospice. Uh, so we actually brought it to the field of medical care ourselves, and that became a separate exhibition in Nicosia, in the Materia uh, Hospice. And I can tell you stories about that because that was a really strange experience too, because you're surrounded with elderly people, um, right, and age and dying tends to go together in some cases at least. Um, and at one point when we built the exhibition, we built it in a consultation room where people would actually come and talk to the doctors about their health, and that's where we put the exhibition. So that was the Materia uh, spin-off. We organized a series of workshops, lectures. Uh, they're still actually online, so if you go to my website, and if you're interested, you can listen to all the, the lectures that we were using. And this is how the participation matters, the, the main uh, hall, the main gallery looked like. It actually had two floors. Uh, there's also a basement. You can actually see the stairs. We built a cinema uh, in the basement. So all the screenings were in the basement. Um, and that was a separate entity. And then the other part of the basement, that was my territory. There I put an installation that I created. So that was actually my sacred space. I'll talk about uh, the mirror of democracy in a, in a second, that was the, the basement. Um, so, what I was doing here was to build an exhibition. I was the main creator. The exhibition was, as I said, about community media affiliated artists that did two things. They talked about participation, so they produced artistic reflections about participation, and in some cases, they generated participatory arts, where ordinary people, non-artists, actually participated in the creation of the artwork itself. Remember the five films of the dying persons? They were not documentary filmmakers, they were not artists, they were very different people without artistic background, but they worked together with artists to produce these films. And that's participatory arts, as it's called. So we had both artistic reflections about participation and participatory arts itself. That was the main idea. But at the same time, I could not help myself, um, except for building the exhibition and organizing the events, I could not help myself of having my own artwork in there as well. And that became, in the basement, the, the, mirror, of part, uh, the, the mirror of democracy, the mirror palace of democracy. Shall I show you a little film? 
it's not perfect because one of the things you do in, um, in a gallery is trying to document then how the exhibition looks like. It's impossible. An exhibition is not about the film about the exhibition. An exhibition is about the material experience of being in the gallery. Right? It's, about, it's about embodiment. So any film is bound to fail. It's extremely difficult to make a good film about an exhibition because it's a different genre. The exhibition is about the space and I cannot rebuild the space. So there's, that's a disclaimer. It's, it's far from perfect because of this. Uh, you can find it on Vimeo. I'll, I'll also talk over it very quickly. Two floors, upstairs. That's where we start. Hey, right. <laughs> so it's basically a pan. So you Ah, lovely. This was a project about rewriting books. So the democratization of writing was there. This was about militarization. It was putting uniforms from all over the island together into one dress. This was about the role of internet in relationship to nature. Lisa did a piece on identity, the role of identity in, in politics. This was a community media broadcasting bike. Went through the city. Female activists. A group of art, of actually African students that produced poetry uh, as part of a course in the Netherlands. One of my favorites, to be honest. Um, pictures of the walls in Cyprus but then moving these pictures to other places. Some of them actually went to Portugal, by the way. So that's our cinema downstairs. This is a film about violence and nature. So it integrates like human violence and nature. This is our, um, the five, five films of dying persons. An activist film on media democracy, a documentary. Again, one on the relationship of, of humankind and nature, which actually was quite one of the sub-teams. A film about homeless people in Brussels that uh, create their own party to change the situation of housing. Another really brilliant project about wolves howling and uh, the communication of wolves as a model of um, thinking about human communication. We actually organized howling in the buffer zone. So we had a howling session in the buffer zone in Cyprus. This is my own stuff. Uh, Mirror Palace of Democracy. Remember the sign you saw? There's, there's an anecdote. And also, um, the, the military dress had a, a part downstairs because it was actually hanging in the staircase. Okay, so it gives you a very short snapshot of how the exhibition looked like. It was only one of the three. <laughs> um, but it was pretty big because it had all the different uh, projects in there. Yeah, not again. So. Um, yeah, I promised you narcissism, so we just go on, right? Uh, downstairs, we had the Mirror Palace of Democracy, which was, and I now need to check with you, it was a Mirror Palace. Do you know what a Mirror Palace is? Anybody can explain it? <laughs> It's a maze, right? But it's a maze with mirrors. So what you often do, you bump into them and you look like you walk through trying to find, feel your way through. Uh, you often find it on, on, in carnivals, in, in sort of these settings of, of pleasure, right? That's what it's meant. Now, this is very similar, uh, including the banging your head into the walls, by the way. Because the little note, you remember it, right? It, it actually says running 
into the walls of democracy can hurt, that was put at exactly the, the place where the uh, coordinator of NIM banged her head, <laughs> thinking that it was actually the exit and not seeing that it was a glass plate. Uh, so that m demarcates the, the complexities of democracy. But this was a reflection about democracy. This was a installation that was a mirror palace. Democracy is a maze, right? You get lost in it. Um, but it also exposed you to five ideological projects. There were five videos in there, five people that were literally talking to you. Right? So they were hailing you. They all had one ideological project. They all started with the same sentence, I am the people. And they tried to convince you of their ideological project, whether it's a militaristic project, whether it's a liberal project, whether it's a project based on solidarity and love, which is, of course, really cute, um, whether it's an authoritarian project, whether it's, right, so you have these five projects, but they all try to convince you that they're right. But in the Mirror Palace, all these sounds merged, and they became one huge cacophonic uh, set of contradictions. And that's what democracy is about, right? It's about these different ideological claims that get mediated. But because I was using video projection and mirrors, a lot of things happened there. One thing was that the ideology was written on your body. Because these videos, they were projected on you with, when you were in there because it started mirroring. But also it started duplicating, it started to copy itself. It actually started to be copied on you. So it also showed how ideology writes on your body, how you become integrated into it. And at the same time, and that was one of the lessons I learned from building it, so arts-based research is also interested in generating knowledge through the artistic practice itself. So when I was building this thing, at some point I had to think about, yeah, but what do I do with the outside of the Mirror Palace? Is that a non-democratic space? How do I deal with that? Because you can actually walk outside of democracy. And even interesting, if, if you want to leave, you actually have to get out of democracy, literally. And that created a whole set of reflections about what is non-democratic, what are the limits of democracy, which I think was quite helpful for me in understanding how uh, also theoretically democracy worked. Uh, it was slightly... Oops, uh, quite an interesting big project because we had to hire a carpenter which is most amusing some of you that know my last name right <laughs> so they were like yeah this is uh, our carpenter uh, behind some of the glass and he was looking at me the carpenter I thought, hey. <laughs> it was nice but it would be literally build it right it was a construction work for two days uh, building a mirror palace in, in that uh, basement, um, bringing in these five videos. So that's how it then at the end looked. Um, uh, some might recognize some of the people because I uh, used, first of all, of course, my partner for that. <laughs> um, I also used two colleagues, Gary Gumpert, who's actually a professor in urban communication was there, Annika Warren, who was and is actually, both are still alive, uh, a professor in uh, human-computer interaction. But I also used two professional actors from the Uppsala City Theatre. So for the first time, actually, in my life, I was di directing professional actors, which was quite an ex interesting experience, because it's very different from directing people that don't have professional theatre training. The difference is that with professional actors, they simply look at you and say, tell me what to do. <laughs> and I try to negotiate participatory arts, right? I try to negotiate, maybe we can talk about it, what are you more comfortable with? And they just go like, tell me what to do. <laughs> Which is quite an interesting experience. Um, it says a lot about professional arts. But they were integrated uh, and uh, they, they were brilliant. I mean. Not a second I can complain about their performance. They were so good. They were very different from the non-professional five, the non-professional three voices that were in there. And um, it again created this balance between professional and non-professional uh, voices in the installation itself. 
And that's the famous note, right? That's where um, uh, my, my dear coordinator, um, Helen, Helen Black, um, bumped into the wall. And she authentically thought it was the exit. Um, the glass decided otherwise. It was actually quite strong, the glass. So it was decent glass. Um, so she didn't go through, thank God. Um, she survived. Uh, just got a bit of a, uh, well, there were two dents. The nose got a bit of a dent, and the ego also got a bit of a dent, because I was looking at her doing it, um, which is sort of slapstick entertainment, right? So let me, again, all the problems of showing this installation, it's film, but it gives you an idea. And if you laugh, I will join you in laughter. We are all humans, and we need to take care of each other. We belong together. Love each other. We are brothers and not sisters. Harm each other. And we are entitled to rule ourselves. Besides, what we do ourselves. But this was nationalism, right? The last voice you heard was a nationalist voice. We're entitled to rule ourselves. The nation, what the nation does, the nation does best. Um, Female actor was the solidarity, the solidarity project. Uh, if you laugh, I will join you in laughter. Right? That's the idea of uh, sharing, right? of belonging, being part of a community. So this is just a quick snapshot. Uh, it, it was actually really hard to film. And if you look really carefully, then you see that I desperately tried to stay out of the filming, but that's impossible in the mirror palace. So, interestingly enough, the artist becomes part of the installation, which is true, you are. Right? That's what arts is, you become integrated. So I left it in there. That's one project. I only have two examples, so in case um, you get slightly tired, uh, this is the last, and this, the second and last example. And this, of course, goes back to what I've been doing here. Uh, Iconoclastic Controversies is the third iteration of an exhibition on photography. Some of the photos haven't been shown anywhere else, so they change, of course. Uh, I had a bit more space here than I had in other cases. Um, the first two were in Cyprus. Uh, one was actually in the buffer zone, so in the militarized zone between uh, north and south, guarded by <laughs> United Nations, so I had my exhibition protected by the UN, which is always nice. Um, the second one was at Nîmes, uh, was in, in, uh, in Limassol, in the arts gallery that then I also um, worked with for Respublica. And the third one is here. Um, the basic idea of this exhibition is to show what nationalism can do. And is to show what, in particular, antagonistic nationalism can do. Cyprus has been a divided island for um, a considerable amount of time, we're getting over 50 years, and the driving force of that divide is antagonistic nationalism. It's a nationalism that defines the other as enemy. Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots that have been defining each other as enemy and actually have been killing each other for quite some time. There's a long history behind that, and the exhibition actually also tries to deal with that history. But what I was in particularly, what I was in particular interested in is how these conflicts are commemorated through statutes and commemoration sites and how the nationalism then get condensed into these statutes. And it's about how statutes actually communicate nationalism and how they communicate the love for war. But in some cases, uh, because it's from the Greek Cypriot perspective, it's the Greek Cypriot uh, statutes and commemoration sites, it's also about loss and sacrifice. Because one of the main wars the Greek Cypriots lost, 1964 was a Turkish invasion. And obviously, um, they, uh, they lost about a bit more than one third of the island. So the interest is not so much in Cyprus, I would say. The interest is in the logics of nationalism and the price you pay for generating these discourses. 
um, of antagonism and, and nationalism. So if you want to have some pictures of the first two, this was uh, the home for cooperation, which is in the buffer zone. And if you look really carefully at the picture at the top, you see a little box right on top on the roof. That's a United Nations watchtower on top of the building uh, because it actually looks at the, um, the Turkish Cypriot side of the buffer zone, the checkpoints that are there, the, uh, the fences and the police and the army that is there. It's not used anymore because things have come down in that part. But still it's this grim reminder. It's quite cozy, so the buffer zone is partially totally falling apart, it's ruins, it's buildings beyond repair, but there are also some of these buildings that have been created to be a meeting point between Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots inside the buffer zone, and that's where we did the exhibition uh, with uh, that NGO um, that gave us access. The second one in, in, the, uh, in NIM, uh, again, it's, this is much more an arts gallery, it's an art space, so it actually shows and offers much more uh, traditional artistic um, contexts. It's white, right? As I said, it's a white cube. Uh, one of the things we did in the second one, because we organized quite a lot of debates, quite a lot of discussions, we had quite a lot of interviews. So in the basement, where later the Mirror Palace would be, in the basement we created a series of listening posts where people could come and sit and actually listen to material that we had collected. So you could just put the headsets on. We also had some bean bags on the other side of the basement where you uh, could just sit and enjoy and rest a bit and listen to the material that we had, reflecting about memorials, reflecting about the Cyprus problem. And we used QR, so people that wanted to have the recordings, they could actually download it through the, the QRs that we were using. The big thing of this exhibition, again, was the communication of academic research on the role of statutes and commemoration sites uh, intertwined with nationalism and antagonism, pictures of the enemy, so to speak. We wanted to communicate that research, but not through writing, but through the exhibition, the photography itself. At the same time, there was a very strong tendency to deconstruct the workings of nationalism. The exhibition is not purely documentary. The exhibition is a critical analysis of antagonistic nationalism. And if you look at the exhibition, and I'm sure you'll, after this talk, you'll all run out and head for the gallery. If you do so, look for these little twists in the photography. It's not purely documentary. It actually plays with a couple of sensitivities trying to deconstruct that antagonistic nationalism. In one case, and it's actually my favorite a photo, uh, there's a very sacred cave where one of the main heroes of the independence war of Cyprus died. He was burned to death there. It's an ultimately sacred place. It's like the ultimate moment to reflect about the heroism and the, right, the, 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 um, um, the sacrifice of the Greek Cypriot hero. But in that photo, I took the picture when actually somebody, let's not use her name, that somebody crawled in. So you actually see a bum sticking out of that cave, which actually desacralizes it. And that's done very intentionally. It got more fun because when Vaya was crawling into the cave, I also noticed that she had a skirt on with the Greek colors. And the skirt was blue and white. So that was like the perfect photo, the perfect moment to capture. But it is a deconstruction of nationalism. If I show these pictures in Cyprus, and people that would be more sensitive to nationalism would, would be upset. And that was exactly what part of that analysis was, to be critical of these, um, of these antagonistic, destructive forms of nationalism. Now, of course, there was also the ability to reach other audiences, non-academic audiences, and to use the exhibition for stimulating academic debates. Obviously, these were other objectives. Oops, sorry, going the wrong way. So I also have a little film about the exhibition. So those who have already seen it, close your eyes. It lasts two minutes. Um, 
It uses uh, Brazilian dubstep, by the way, so the music is pretty cool, I think. It's not mine. Very, very quick impression. Remember the little statue you see at the end in this cage? Uh, this is Grivas. Grivas was the leader of the radical right wing extremist uh, Greek nationalist uh, EOKA uh, that triggered independence but at the expense of killing left wing Greek Cypriots, left wing Turkish Cypriots, and basically all other Turkish Cypriots as well apart from the British that they were fighting against. So this was one of the key instigators of the Cyprus conflict. When I brought the statue, because I wanted to have uh, a number of, of elements in the exhibition that were referring to the conflict in order to contextualize it, I actually hadn't really found a good solution of how to handle him, because it's not necessarily my best friend. I mean, there's a very critical analysis of the role of Grievous that you can make. Originally, I was thinking maybe I should put lipstick on his mouth mm -hmm. right, as an attempt to, again, deconstruct that nationalism and to use gender there um, as, as a tool. Uh, but then when I got here, I found this lovely cage. Uh, so I put him in prison. I thought that was actually quite accurate. Now, you, if you go into the exhibition, you might not see him, so you have to look for him. That's the, the assignment. Look for Grievous. He's there in the prison, uh, being himself, looking at the visitors, but from bars. Right? So that also is serendipity. This is coincidence. This is how you work with the gallery when you're there, uh, using the gallery to, to make things uh, better. Yips. Okay, let me conclude with a, a few reflections about, uh, in particular, the iconoclastic controversies uh, exhibition. I'm not saying that this is easy. And if I show this to colleagues, as I am now doing, one of the responses is like, am I supposed to do this? <laughs> this is difficult. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, and one of the responses I got, some time ago was, well, it's clear that um, arts-based research is not for everybody, meaning that I would never be able to do that, that person said, which is fair. I'm not saying that everybody has to do this, right? It is a very difficult process because it is getting in touch with what I would call your other side, your more creative side. Now, at the same time, remember that Respublica was about community media-affiliated artists, 
I was arguing that in community media, it's not about activism and democracy only, it's also about this creativity that's very much there. Actually, that argument also holds for academia. We don't always talk about our creativities. Writing, going back to writing, academic writing, is a creative process. It's, of course, part of different, of a huge set of rules and conventions. You can't do anything. But actually, there's a lot of creativity in there. So we have this, this kind of creativity. And I think it is up to us to bring that out as well. Still doing academic research, communicating um, in an academic way, just using a different language or a different set of tools, a different repertoire. But we do have that creativity, more than we think. Um, it doesn't mean that there are no problems. One of the interesting problems in uh, iconoclastic controversies that I was dealing with was linearity. Let me explain. If you write, you go from A to B. Right? A written text is linear. Now you can play with that, but we often don't. Right? We start with the introduction, it needs to be well structured, the introduction has to say what's going to come, your first part will be this, your first part is extremely well structured, blah, blah, blah. It's linear. An arts exhibition is not. Photography is not. Film is not. Sound is not. Sound is actually incredibly... I have a, a community radio background, so I've worked with sound a lot. Sound is fascinating in the sense that you can create multiple linearities. Right? If you do editing, you can create different layers. If I write, I can't write the same text at the same time, or different text at the same time. I can't do that. If I use sound, I can actually use different layers at the same time. It's a different kind of linearity. It's still linear, but it's, it has multiple layers. It's like a matrix. It's multidimensional. You can do wonderful things with that. But the written text is linear. Now, if you do academic research, you're very much part of this linear lo lo uh, sort of logics. Right? If, if you're in training as a student, you get feedback. It will always be about create a good structure. That's the linearity that is so important to us. And then all of a sudden you create an exhibition. And then the question is, the question is, how linear does that have to be, to be an academic text? Do you have to tell the audience, start here, go and stand here and look at this picture first. And then there's the second chapter. Look at these pictures second. Also, when it comes to additional texts, right? how do you structure the narrative? Well, you use texts to do that. But then you create linearity, which moves away from what photography is very much about. It's the nonlinear. And that tension is actually deeply, deeply problematic. And if you look at uh, the exhibition here, so I see three, again a challenge. Look at how I did this, because that's the third edition, and I think I'm slowly learning how to handle it in ways that I'm at least happy with. I'll give you a few hints. There is a little sign, exhibition starts here, but you can hardly see it. It's very, very subtle, almost invisible. There is a route that I created, and you're sort of guided into that route. But at the same time, what I truly hate about exhibitions is this authoritarian walk, right, where the curator decides how you have to walk through the exhibition. I don't want to do that. I prefer that openness. But if I totally open it, I lose my academic structure. I use the linearity of the analysis. And finding that balance is extremely difficult. And there are all sorts of little tricks that are being used to integrate some sense of linearity of structure without becoming authoritarian. And this is one example, the labels. Uh, you've seen the, the, the barbed wire box that has a series of pictures. It actually has labels that indicate that they belong together and that they're part of a particular conflict, namely the invasion of 1964. They're also part of a, um, a hegemonic representation of that conflict. This room, right, there are two rooms in the, the exhibition, this room 
is about the hegemonic representations. These are the traditional ways of thinking about the war hero, celebrating war, basically. The other room plays a different role. It's about the contradictions. It's about when these hegemonic discourses go wrong, or it's about when there are counter-hegemonic discourses, discourses that are actually not discourses of war, but discourses of peace. So there is a very strongly developed structure in it, but you hardly notice it, and you are free to ignore it. And that's the kind of balance that I do like, but it is very, very uh, difficult. Right? And I'm giving it away. That's the little note saying, start here. So it's very, very small, and you hardly see it. It's actually quite windy there, so it's even moving. So right? that's the balance that uh, matters in this um, linearity. Oh, sorry. Um, and of course, I've been talking about, in the previous talks, I've referred to Deleuze and Guattari and the Mille Plateau, the thousand platforms. The idea that you can enter a book uh, as Mille Plateau, um, but also an exhibition at many different places, and that you should be entitled to. But if you become too linear, it actually is an authoritarian move that forces the reader to follow a particular trajectory. And this kind of thinking about books, but also used for exhibitions, gives more freedom to the, the user, the visitor, the reader, um, whatever you want to call a person, to find his or her own way through the exhibition or through the book. So that's one thing. Second, context. So you take an exhibition about Cyprus and you bring it to Brazil. Strange things happen. It poses a few little tiny minor problems. Like everybody looks at you and goes, Cyprus? <laughs> um, and you see this moment of reflection. And then of course there's the thing like, yeah, but I don't know that much about Cyprus, people tell me. And I can understand, why would you? Um, I can reassure you. 99% of the Europeans also don't know anything about Cyprus. It's one of these forgotten islands, in a way, uh, where the, the dramatic part of the conflict is erased from our minds. So I've been explaining Cyprus to basically everybody. Um, of course, Cypriots have some sense of history, but even the younger generations of Cypriots don't always know about the conflict. At some point, I was doing a lecture uh, in Cyprus, in Limassol, uh, for um, 18, 19 year olds. And I was showing some of the iconic pictures of the conflict. And I just said, like, oh yeah, this is a Cypriot audience, so you know these pictures. And I went, tak, 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 tak. And the lecture said, like, no, tak, 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 go back. They don't know. And then I took each of the pictures and I actually asked them, do you know this picture? Have you seen it? And they all went, like, no idea. So, also, of course, because of generational. <laughs> Uh, effects also on Cyprus itself, a lot of the history is forgotten. Uh, and a lot of these things are unknown. But of course, in the region, people will know the basics. They will know about the divide. They will know about the different wars. Turks and Greeks will also have fairly good knowledge. But that knowledge will also be very ideological. Right? It's also about taking sides. One example of that is that Turkey refers to the invasion of 1964, where the Turkish army invaded the north of Cyprus. They refer to it as a peace operation. Um, in the south, it's an occupation, it's an invasion. And these different words are used by different communities. And if I talk to different groups and I use the wrong word, I will get a backlash. Uh, there will be questions asked. And I have answers to that because I have my own analysis. And that's based on the, the, the academic historical literature that is good about the conflict. But I will be questioned even on the basis of which words I use. So there is, um, there is quite a lot of knowledge in that part of Europe. But even that is, is, is ideological knowledge, deeply ideological knowledge. And in other parts of the, of the world, nobody has basically a clue. So if you bring the exhibition here, what do you do? Well, you try to explain, <laughs> obviously. So in this case, and this was the first time um, ever for the uh, iconoclastic controversies, I added objects. Right? In the exhibition now, you have at the back of the main room, you have a series of boxes that have actually quite authentic historical material. 
one of the nicest catches, uh, I might be now sounding like, a, like an historian, but yeah, I also have this deep respect for authentic things. Um, at the very back, there's a, a, an election poster from 1959. It's actually an authentic one, uh, where the new president was elected for the first time, Makarios, uh, in 59, uh, preparing for the independence of 1960. So there are a number of these objects that I brought into the exhibition to explain, right? to give an idea of what Cyprus is about, what the Cyprus problem is about, so that people have the context to understand. But the question is, how much context do you give? Because if you drown people in context and in texts that are explaining everything, there is no photography exhibition. There's a book, <laughs> right? That, the book that's hanging on the wall then which is annoying because you can't read texts that are hanging and you don't want to spend time reading texts in, in a, or too much text in a gallery. So the issue is how much context, how much text do you bring in? And in some cases, you try to find the balance. And this is um, Iconoclastic Controversies number two, uh, where the photo is actually huge. It's a really big print of the buffer zone. Um, and below you see the militarized part, it's a Greek Cypriot base, um, fortified, barbed wire, blah, blah, blah. That picture is also here. But then next to it, you get the text, because there is a need to explain what is the buffer zone, what is this picture. It's a very particular place. Uh, it's actually still one of the more tricky places, uh, the more dangerous places of the buffer zone. Um, so it explains that, even to Cypriots. Uh, as this was in, in Cyprus, and even more here. Uh, so you find text panels. Here, instead of putting them on the wall, I put them in on the boxes, so that you can actually read down, which I think is a bit more comfortable than just to have to look at the wall. But again, how much is a real problem? Because if you put too much of the text in there, it becomes a book. And that's a very, very difficult balance to reach. And these are the boxes with the context. Uh, right, so there were a series of boxes that um, that were added uh, to iconoclastic controversies number three, just to provide context with authentic material of the 1955-59 period, which was the independence war, and the 1974 period, which was the invasion. The box you see here is the invasion box, and actually describes the runner-up and the invasion uh, itself. And then we have this picture. This was actually Fernando's idea. And it actually shows it's all his fault, right? It shows that if you build an exhibition, you also don't do it on your own. And in this case, there are lots of people. And Fernando and, and Jairo were key people, uh, not just in making everything possible, building the infrastructure, but also bringing new ideas into the exhibition. If you write a book, you don't write it on your own. There are editors, there are publishers, you work with a lot of people. There are colleagues that give you feedback, that give you ideas, you have conversations about it when you're writing it. This is the same thing. And here, we, um, Fernando very sort of aptly pointed out to me, that maybe you want to have a globe that then has Cyprus on it, so that people can actually look on the globe, touch it, and see where Cyprus actually is on the globe which was a pretty cool idea. Uh, the globe looked terribly. Uh, the stand, it had this little plastic stand, which was like appallingly ugly. So I took it off and I hung it. But I also put a, a little uh, note on there, because you can actually write a very uh, directive text saying, this is Cyprus, it's in the Mediterranean, look there. And you could put a finger on the globe saying, I used a different strategy. I just said, try to find Cyprus. If you can't find it, look for the Mediterranean. So it's much more invitational, which I, again, like more than this directive way of, of dealing with exhibitions. But I also then, and this is, you will never guess, I also put these uh, little pieces of stone in white, right? There are white rocks on there, four. And on the conclusions box, you also have four bigger rocks, white. There's a reason for doing that. The globe actually also plays a very important role. It's not 
Cyprus that is there, it's the globe that is there. It's actually saying problems of antagonistic nationalism are not just the problem of Cyprus, they're a problem of the world. It's not just about Cyprus. It might also be a bit about Brazil. Yeah, elections coming up now. I know, I, I, I shouldn't poke it in, <laughs> I shouldn't hurt you too much with this. But this is sort of a global phenomenon. If you look at the European um, antagonistic nationalisms, we're in trouble. There are really, really serious issues in, in Europe. And I think that also in South America, there are serious, serious issues with antagonistic nationalism. Footnote, I don't necessarily, I'm not a nationalist, but from a democratic perspective, I do not object to nationalism. It's one of the key ideological forces. I do object to antagonistic nationalism because that's about killing the other. That I have uh, a serious issue with. But even if I don't share the nationalism that some people have, I do acknowledge that it's an important force and that it's a key political project that I shouldn't dis discredit as out of nothing. But I will always critique antagonistic nationalisms because of its destructive force. Nationalism is a sleeping dragon. If you awake nationalism, it can kill. And we need to be careful with these forces. But there are many other ideological projects that can do the same. Communism was actually a pretty decent example as well. It killed. And having been in Central and Eastern Europe and having been in Russia, former USSR, it killed. It has done serious damage. But it depends how you define it. Nationalism is the same, it's how you use it, how you define it, and it can be used in the most horrific ways. And that's a global problem. These little rocks, they are there for a reason, because I don't have this strange hobby of sort of crawling through the campus, looking for little rocks and then painting them white. It's not a hobby, trust me, I don't do that. And maybe if somebody of you actually does that, I do apologize, but I somehow assume nobody does that. It would be strange, right? This brings us back to South Africa uh, and the colonial empire, the British colonial empire. Cyprus was a, co a colony of the UK, right? Um, if you go to Zululand, uh, you'll find a place which is called Izandwana. Izandwana is a battlefield. It was the battlefield where the Zulu forces destroyed the British army. It was one of the key moments uh, of colonial defeat. Just like right, the 1955-59 uh, uprising in Cyprus was actually a very painful moment for the British army because they couldn't hold the colony. Well, there, of course, in South Africa, uh, they did, the British did capture um, the entire region, but not until they were defeated first, because they were basically arrogant, thinking that they were primitives, and they got chopped to pieces. Now, uh, Islandwana is, is a fascinating place because it's not a traditional memorial site. Um, it's covered with little white rocks, because the white rocks are indicating the places where the British soldiers fell. Because they're right, the old formation, remember, right? We are talking 19th century, so these are formations, lines of riflemen. The formation broke and they fled. And why they were running away or why they were regrouping into small groups, they were all killed. They were totally exterminated there on the battlefield. And on each of these places, you find a white little rock. That's a reminder. Now, you will never know if I wouldn't explain you. There's no way of making this connection. Sure, and this is just in my mind, yes, but it is bringing in that global dimension. And it is actually showing that there's a connection with the British Empire here. Uh, and there's a possibility of defeat, but there's also the possibility of bloodshed. Because, of course, after that battle, the, the Brits did... Um, continue the bloody march in, into Zululand and uh, colonized it, uh, which me meant basically killing a lot of people, right? That's the definition of colonization. And um, that's a reminder. It's a very, very grim 
reminder of that colonial history, which is a global history, with the British Empire playing a bit of a key role uh, in, in that process. So that's why the little rocks are there. But that's just a little detail that I added on the spot. Again, adding context. Another problem that these exhibitions have is how do you deal with the inside and the outside? This is, by the way, Edward Said, right? It's a key author writing about Orientalism, uh, definitions of the other. But what happens if you are the author? Uh, what happens if you are the other at the same time? If you're the photographer that goes there, um, not as a Cypriot. Right? I'm Belgian. I'm not a Cypriot. Don't have that much connections. Uh, there's no family whatsoever. I'm an outsider. I actually do care about the island, and I do care about its history, and I do care about its politics and its problems. It is, I tend to call it, a paradise with a problem. Uh, and it is a paradise, trust me. It's a gorgeous place. But it has a really serious issue, uh, which is this, it's called the Cyprus problem, actually, literally. That's the term that's used there. But how do you handle that? You just go there. Uh, you study, I stayed on the island for a year, you study, you understand, you learn, but you'll never be an insider. I never grew up feeling the Cyprus problem. I went there and I felt it. Of course, it's hard not to. I felt the trauma. It's a terrible scar. People still deal with loss from that period, from 74. They lost, a lot of them lost their houses, for instance. A lot of them lost family. So they're still struggling with this, and it is still a trauma. But how can you handle that if you haven't been there? Right? How can you understand if you're not part of that? And how can you research it if you haven't had that opportunity of being literally embedded in the knowledge about that conflict? How to do that? It's not an easy thing. And um, this is one of the memorials, uh, or one of the commemoration sites. Uh, this is not a picture that is part of the exhibition. Uh, it's a huge mural. Uh, and these are Greek Cypriots that are demanding uh, to find out about their missing family members. About 1,500 of them went missing in 74 and earlier in the 60s, but mostly in 74. Uh, the Greek Cypriot government contributed to keeping the idea alive that these family members were alive. They were not. They were all dead. But there was lots of uncertainty and there was lots of hope. And you know how destructive hope can be, right? It's a terrible thing. If you hope for your family to come back, uh, but you don't know anything about it, there's no closure. This went on for 40, 50 years. And only then the bodies were found in many cases. And there's still a lot of them missing, by the way. And this is a painting that is referring to that. It's the typical carrying of the photos, right? It's sort of a ritual that you often see uh, from that period. Usually, actually, the, uh, uh, the mother or the, uh, the wife dressed in black, colors of mourning, holding the picture of the missing person. I haven't lived through this experience. Right? I wasn't there. I didn't lose that family. How can I talk to these people and say, well, maybe you want to be a bit critical towards antagonistic nationalism? It's not an easy thing to do. And in some cases, my... Analysis is not accepted. And I am defined as the uh, outsider. In one of the broadcasts about this exhibition, uh, a photographer, uh, Pavlos uh, Vrionidis, said, uh, it is as somebody says, hey guys, your monuments are rusty. You need someone to fix them up. This makes me feel awkward, as if we're being examined by our colonialists. That's me, right? I was all of a sudden a colonialist. I went like, yeah, maybe, first of all, I'm not British. <laughs> yes, Belgium has had a colonial past and it did the most horrific things. I'll be happy to take responsibility as one of the uh, people that has han ancestors that were responsible for the slaughter in the Congo. Yes, no problem there. But I won't accept this. But that's the point. It, it happens anyway. I was dragged into the politics of Cyprus. And my analysis was rejected because I was an outsider or because I was taking sides 
for peace. In an antagonistic nationalistic logic, that's almost like being a traitor. So the politics of the island actually drag you into that and they use you being non-Cypriot as an argument against you, which makes it really hard. But at the same time, there is the ethical issue. Am I entitled to represent other people's suffering? It's not as straightforward as it sounds. I decided that I could, and that I could actually contribute to the analysis as an outsider, not being embedded in all the ideological cliches of Cyprus. Because there are many myths, there are many historical uh, reconfigurations that circulate, and me not being exposed to them is also an advantage. In a way, I can bring a fresh mind to the conflict. But it does produce ethical issues because you're talking about the suffering of other people, which is very intense and very deep. And you have to be very empathic and uh, respectful towards that. And it does produce all sorts of problems. So let me conclude with uh, a piece from The Guardian. Um, there's an important strategy that every academic uh, is told to pursue, uh, James Mulholland writes, um, and that's to, of course, communicate to the outside world, um, writing opinion pieces. And he writes in this piece, stay in your offices. And I structurally disagree with this point um, for a wide variety of reasons. I don't think we should stay in our offices. I think we should move out and we should share our knowledge. That's a democratic responsibility. But, but, <laughs> it doesn't mean that we have to give away control over the analysis that we create. We are the authors. Whatever language we use, whatever tools, repertoires we use, it's we that speak not somebody else that translates our work into something else. It's our responsibility to speak, but it's also something we should control. And if you write a piece for a newspaper, well, then the editor might make something totally different out of it, where you go like, this is no longer what I wanted to say. We should maintain control. And we should remain academics. It doesn't mean that we have to stay in the office and write. We can be academics in many different ways. We can use the arts and arts-based research to be an academic and be an artist at the same time. We can use hybrid identities. We can mix these positions. We can do very different things. But the one thing we shouldn't do, I would argue, is stay in the office. And what we should, I would argue, do is combine these two things. It's my last slide. We should have and maintain control over our narratives. That is an academic responsibility. We speak on the basis of a history of academic research, of a set of practices that have been tried and tested over centuries and that are valid ways and plausible ways of talking about social reality. They are valid ways in generating knowledge and truth that's what we do. And we should maintain control. But at the same time, we can bring that creativity out and give it a bit more space and not be only the slightly boring, undoubtedly incredibly interesting writers that sit behind the computer and do our stuff. We can be more than that while still being academics at the same time. And that's my story. Thank you, Nico. We have time to discuss these important points using the experience of the public about the sense of knowledge through exhibitions and the use of the art in the academic production. We have something like 20 minutes to this debate. 
who is the first person? Who was the first person to ask the? Yeah, yeah, we can translate the questions in Portuguese, in Spanish, in French, and I don't know if Arabic is possible, but please, Professor. Thank you. Bom dia. Falarei a few words in 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 Portuguese and in English. And great for, for your presence. I think you bring us uh, a lot of questions, more to think to than to to talk, because uh, it's very com complex. Because you bring us problems like sociology, sociology, art, and communication. Three things. Three. Uh, fields, uh, you, you, you need to think uh, specifically, but in, in your target, your way, you mix them to, to reflect about a problem that is nationalism. But I think you introduce in, the, the, in this the, this, in this field, in this large field, a uh, big problem that is the epistemological problem. Uh, how we make the knowledge, okay? Well, it's a big, big, big problem. <laughs> um, uh, the, in this problem, uh, there is something is uh, frightening. me. Uh, that is the the question about the responsibility of academic academic way, you know, the, the space. Uh, uh, I think there is a confusion uh, 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 a limit not uh, well no. Uh, between academic ways, work, the ethic, the, ethic, no, the, the, the means of the academic way, and the public, no, the society. Uh, and this, uh, the, the, this problem, the, uh, in the, this frontier, no, not be, not well known, not well designed, uh, confuse us. Okay? Uh, that's the the only points I want to to, to take because uh, we are in the academic place uh, and we live in a moment and the academic place is uh, how is attacked attacked no? 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 By the the system that said, uh, ah, you are very uh, cost cost a lot, and you 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 need to reinvent, okay? And I think is uh, is a very critical point. Thank you. Allow me to follow up very quickly because I think you're. I don't disagree. I mean, what? And I have my my moments of uh, interest in the in field theory, right? Bourdieu's work. Academia is a field. It has its own logics. It's different from other fields because of that. And I do think we need to protect it at all cost because it's a very precious field. And one of the big incursions into the field of academia is actually the logics of the market that is being imposed on us, more and more. If you look at, again, what the European Commission is doing in Europe, uh, they're basically instrumentalizing us. They're using us for other things than that we're supposed to be used for. We are good at generating and producing knowledge. We're not good in taking the place of companies in training their staff. But that's what more and more businesses and, for instance, the European Commission is expecting us to do. That's a deeply problematic 
development and we need to resist that at all cost. Uh, there is this idea of let's modernize the university, which basically means let's destroy it, let's incorporate it in the market logics, and let's um, use it for other things than what it has proven its value for. So, full agreement. We have to be very protective. And yes, there is a very strong tendency of the, the metaphor of, of the ivory tower is used. There's a very strong tendency of instrumentalizing us by telling us you have to go outside your ivory tower. Mm. And that metaphor is incredibly dangerous. We need to defend our tower. It's our tower. What I am saying is maybe we can redecorate the inside of the tower a bit differently. And maybe we can add a few rooms to the tower. But it's our tower. And our tower should be defended at all costs against these attacks from an outside world. I mean, I'm not going to create, uh, it's not a declaration of war on political systems. There's always been these pressures, and that's part of our social realities for centuries as well. But we should defend our tower. So, full agreement. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Nico, I wanted to ask, uh, you talk about using these different layers of discourse that can and might lead to some inter and intra-textuality into what you're showing. And I think that's very interesting. But how to keep this sort of epistemological surveillance into what you're doing? I mean, not to uh, mislead the path, the theoretical uh, that you have traced the concepts that are main to your research into those different layers of discourse that you're talking about, the, the meaning that not going into just one line, but also using images and sound, and how to keep integrated that idea into what is shown in the exhibition and that maintaining the theoretical part of it. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks. It's, it's a good question. So you, you, you lived up to the expectations of coming up with a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. It's a really hard one. Uh, and maybe I can answer from practice. Um, because what we have been doing in these projects is also then, after the exhibitions, is to reevaluate them and to start writing about them. And actually to use the experiences of the, uh, of the exhibitions for publications. So there is a, like a, a permanent dynamics between these different formats where you use different approaches, tools, to create a, a coherent body of knowledge. Uh, but you're right in saying that this is, is pretty, pretty difficult to make sure that everything stays aligned. Because every um, repertoire, every tool has its own logics, it has its own limits. Right? Written language is extremely limiting in what it can do. Um, but photography is, in different ways, extremely limiting in what it can do. But I would argue that if you bring them together, you can do more. But your point is then integration. Um, and my answer would be it's, it's a matter of combination and building on top of each other. It's not a, a one-shot event. This is part of a larger process. Remember that at the end, academic knowledge, it's not an individual accomplishment, right? The Eureka moment, that's another myth. Uh, it's a collective process. Uh, but it's also a time-based process. Knowledge is about learning. Learning is about time, right? You don't learn on the spot. It takes time to learn. It takes dialogue. It takes exchange to learn. That's time-based. But also in your own projects, you can actually integrate that. So you can create these different layers over time that also go back to what you've done in an exhibition. And again, I would almost say signifying and re-signifying, contextualizing and recontextualizing it. I think that would be my answer. It's a time, it's a project, it's a trajectory that um, 
has its own logics over time, but that also then goes into more general academic knowledge production where other people start working with it and changing it and improving it uh, and critiquing it, which is perfectly fine, of course, but that also allows for this uh, enrichment. And that brings me then to the other point. Uh, yes, we try to integrate our work, we try to create conceptual coherence, and then our colleagues start working with it and they do something totally different with it. Which is on the one hand, maybe for some very frustrating, but also very rewarding. We can't control our own stories in academia. We shouldn't. I mean, that's what academic knowledge production is about. It's about giving something to an academic community and beyond that goes to work with it, that does things, that misinterprets things, that destroys your coherence and sort of pulls it apart and does other things with that, and that's also perfectly fine. So I don't want to defend total integration because that would mean total closure. And so we need that openness because that's part of, of the academic dialogue, which is what knowledge production is actually about. Not going into this linear, uh, narrative of progress, obviously, but going in permanent cycles and, and permanent iterations of, of knowledge production on the basis of intellectual exchange. Uh, good morning. Uh, I was wondering uh, which one came first? Like, were you in interested in photography and installations and you find ways to to uh, put it mm. into your academic uh, research, or did you discover it as a way to express and communicate your research, like a new language for it? it it's a really good question, and it's really hard to answer, because the obvious answer would be both, but I'm not supposed to do that, right? That's not, <laughs> that's not fair. It actually went in cycles. So I, I think that um, a lot of the stuff I've done for alternative radio um, was in the 1990s <laughs> and early 2000s uh, a bit. Um, and I got really interested in, in doing that in that stage. And then I moved more to academia and started using more traditional ways. And then I went back to what I was doing uh, before with radio, I started, for instance, working with sound artists in, in trying to, to give you one other project, try to translate an academic text, written text, into sound art uh, as an experiment, which is a pretty strange thing to do, I confess. Um, and uh, the Cypress story actually kicks into these waves uh, and these cycles of uh, interest in combining things uh, but I, I now I'm sounding terribly Hegelian. It's like there was this thesis and then there was the antithesis and now we have the synthesis. But actually that's pretty close how it went. So I started from a more artistic, creative background doing radio, moved into academia and at some point decided I need to merge these two because I can work with them and it's too frustrating to keep them out, apart from each other. That exactly also what happened on Cyprus. I was there for a research project. I was doing a fairly traditional research project on community media and, and conflict. Um, and then I understood that I had to understand the history. And the statutes became a way of understanding that history, of generating access to Cypriot history. And then I started documenting them. And then. I started thinking, but this is not enough. I can do more. I can start creating much more uh, aesthetic dimensions in the photography, and I can actually use that um, also to communicate my research. And so it developed into this, again, these waves and cycles, and it developed into uh, a spin-off, which is iconoclastic controversies. I never planned that when I went to Cyprus. I didn't go there to say, I'm going to do photography. Um, we spend a lot of time, three or four months, going because there are, I think in total, there are like 600 in the south of these memorials. So we saw a lot of them. Um, almost crashed the car in a couple of cases, uh, almost destroyed the car in a couple of other cases. Um, but really sort of being there, seeing them, feeling them, uh, was a very important access point into the, the history 
but it then turned out to be a project in its own right, which is iconoclastic controversies. But thanks for the question. That's, it's important. You're right. Morning. Uh, thank you for the beautiful lecture. I'm, I'm thinking about the relationship between words and images and words and exhibition. Yeah. Because uh, from the beginning, you've said, uh, you've put in relation a few uh, kind of like pairs of, uh, not opposites, but uh, related concepts. I would say uh, the embodiment element that's present with, yeah. uh, let's say, photography and exhibition and the detachment and abstraction that's made yeah. possible through language. Uh, I would also say the materiality of uh, exhibition. Yeah. Uh, and now answering the question of the colleague, you said uh, the openness uh, that you get, for example, with photography and exhibition mm -hmm. and the closure that you can offer through text, uh, for example. But you, you've also opened up the text. But you can also close down the photograph, yes. uh, which is something that you kind of do uh, some, in, in some moments in the exhibition, uh, you yeah. can see that the, the image has few elements that closes and kind of like surrounds the meaning. Uh, so that's, that's kind of like the question that I wanted to ask. In terms of knowledge production, uh, how would you see the relationship between opening and closing, embodying and detaching, and all of those movements that you've been yeah. describing? Well, well thanks. Um, I think we'll be here till lunch with that question. Uh, I, somehow when we were talking, I, I went back to Bart, Roland Bart, and his discussions about the openness and uh, the closeness of the text, because that's basically the dilemma. And yes, there are many different variations, both because Bart was writing about literature, right, and the openness and the closeness of, of literature. So there are many variations possible, and there are, these are partially interventions. Uh, that the author brings. So yes, you can actually generate very open written texts and you can generate very open photography and you can do the opposite, close it down. The, one of the characteristics of academic writing is that you don't go, I think, in totally open texts. That is not what we do. That makes it a very artistic approach, which can be very valuable, but we still communicate an analysis. And that brings closure, a certain degree of closure. I do think that, uh, coming from a cultural studies background, uh, also taking encoding and decoding to academic texts, I think we need to be a bit careful, because a closed text is also open for interpretation, obviously, you offer it. But what you do on the encoding side is an intervention. It is the communication of a particular set of ideas where both uh, the written text and photographs and exhibitions actually contribute to. But you should allow the freedom of the decoding. And you should not sort of try to be the authoritarian person that then decides. And I think that applies. So in that sense, I want to move away from the dichotomy between the a written text and the photograph, which would be deeply problematic. And I think that the... Um, the overarching analysis would be that a, an academic analysis produces an element of closure, but should also produce an element of openness in the sense that the encoding uh, is, is, has that dimension of, of closure, but then, of course, uh, the decoding allows for the moment of openness. Knowing that, and I'm, I'm going to confuse everybody, that an interpretation is also a moment of closure. But it might be a different closure. And that's what the openness is about, right? Because we interpret from different perspectives, and these different perspectives produce closure. Um, but I think the basic answer would be that from an academic perspective, I would be very careful to create too much openness, whether it's in texts or in photography or in exhibition, because then I would feel that I'm moving into, talking about these different fields, actually, I, I would feel that I would move into a purely artistic field moving away from the academic field. I'm interested in the intersection between them, and that produces these dynamics of openness and closure. I have a question. Yeah, I knew that. <laughs> so, but you, you said also, um, you've defended the status of the author uh, yeah. quite uh, strongly. So, uh, doesn't openness um, kind of open up the seat of the author as well? Um, bringing the audience as well as in, within the status? 
Well, that's the, um, again, this is very much barred, right? So one of the pieces I've actually argued for is that the author has died twice <laughs> by now. But let's not go <laughs> into these discussions. The author with the capital A is dead. Um, there I am very much aligned with Bart's perspective. It doesn't mean that we're not entitled to authorship. That's a very different thing. I do defend authorship because I do want to have a voice. I mean, I'm interested in participatory theory, which is all about having a voice, also about listening, but also having a voice. We are entitled to these voices, and we should defend having a voice, especially in academia. It significantly matters. But if we transform our author with a little a into the author with a capital A, we end up in trouble. And we create a type of authorship which is authoritarian, <laughs> uh, which is non-democratic, which is non-dialogical, and deeply problematic. But there is a difference between speaking with authority and speaking in an authoritarian way. I don't mind speaking with authority. I have no objection there. Um, because I do think that academics produce that authority from the procedures that we use that allow us to claim we're speaking truth. It's a claim. It's not an ultimate moment of fixation. It's a claim. But our claim is very plausible if we use our procedures wisely, if we embed our work in the work of the academic community. We make that claim. So there is no issue there for me to speak with authority. And you can do that with photography as well, right? going back to your first part of the question. I don't want to speak in an authoritarian way. I don't want to close down the options of disagreement. That's where the dialogical kicks in, and that's extremely significant. But I don't mind speaking with authority. I think that's a good thing. I do mind speaking in the authoritarian way, because I think that in a 21st democratic constellation is not the way uh, for us as academics to proceed. Well, thanks, great question. Nico, maybe the last question. It's important to listen your opinion about slow science and uh, yeah. knowledge conditions in current days. Yeah. We will have this discussion next Friday yeah. at 10. But if you can begin these main points, I thank you. you no, know, th thanks for that. Uh, in a way, this is actually related to slow science, but uh, people that know me always make fun of me if I speak about slow science because I do too much. Um, and I do it too quickly, which is even worse. It totally contradicts slow science. But for me, it doesn't. For me, slow science is resisting forms of, um, of disciplining that are being imposed on us by evaluation systems, by external system, external fields like politics. Uh, and we've become our own worst enemies in accepting them. Right? A lot of the, uh, the disciplining that happens in academia is actually accepted and created and recreated by ourselves. Our evaluation systems are academic evaluation systems implemented by uh, heads of departments, implemented by vice chancellors that are part of the academic system. That's a deeply problematic situation because it's doing harm to academia and it's doing harm to knowledge production itself. One example, if we keep on counting our publications, we're doing something awfully wrong. Because it's not about having five or ten per year, it's about the ideas you bring to the academic community and the world outside that academic community. What I think we need to be extremely careful with is to go into a rat race where through the logics of quantification and audit cultures we create a, uh, an inflation of demands and that's what slow science is resisting, it's the inflation of demands which is the, the real problem where 20 years ago it was good to have a few articles, now you need to have 10 if you want to apply for that kind of job you need to have 100 and that 
there's an increasing demand which has led to a logic, uh, you know the, uh, the, the publish or perish logics. It's actually wrong, right? It's publish and perish mm -hmm. logics. It has created that, and it's a deeply, deeply problematic situation that we need to resist. One thing we need to do is to, I think, within the academic community is to agree on what the minimum is that would qualify for good academic careers. There's no harm in saying like, yeah, well, you should do a couple of things, really. You should do some teaching, you should do some publishing, you should do some research, you should do some outreach, extension. It's okay to say that. But that needs to be a minimal level because there, there's a basic principle of the good enough that we need to implement. We've forgotten that. Uh, it's not about more, 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 more. It's about good enough. Once you reach the threshold, it's good enough. And then you're okay as an academic. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to wake up in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I need to do more. I need to still finish that article. It's the good enough principle that is really important for us. And that's what slow science, I think, for me, is trying to do. But behind all this, and that's bring, that brings me back to this exhibition and these kinds of art-based uh, research projects, uh, we need to keep the pleasure in our work. Because if I talk to colleagues, it's sometimes appalling to see that they've become totally instrumentalized and that they only think about, oh yeah, I need to get that article out. Not because they're having fun writing the article, not because they actually get the pleasure out of producing knowledge, out of the creativity that is part of that, but simply because they're expected to publish so many articles and they just have to do it, whatever it is which also brings us to the problem of predators, where people start publishing rubbish just because they need to tick the boxes. What we need to protect is the pleasure in knowledge production. And there, doing different things, using different repertoires and languages is, is key. Because it's fun to do an exhibition, and it's fun to write an article and to write a book, but having these different ways of engaging with academic pleasure is absolutely vital. And that's, I think, what this also brings to the table. It's the enjoyment of spending uh, time running through a country and trying to find the bloody statutes that are sometimes pretty much hidden, but then using that to produce academic knowledge in ways that is pleasurable to us, and hopefully to the audiences, but also to ourselves. And that we need to cherish. Because if we lose pleasure, if we lose fun, uh, if, if we lose the, um, the emotional dimensions of our work, we'll become robots. And robots can be incorporated immediately. And that would destroy us. So we need to be very, very careful these days. That's a happy ending, right? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Nick. Thank you, people. See you next opportunity.